Today's service, last week, uh, we looked at um, the advancement of the gospel while Paul was in chains. So first of all, I would maybe want to ask you, did you have some joy this week? Anyone that was maybe challenged with their joy this week? Or maybe you did have some joy this week. So I'm quickly going to go through just a short summary of last week's sermon. And it was from verses 12 to verses 14. And we see that Paul wrote to the Philippian church to inform them that even though he finds himself in prison by being chained to a Roman soldier, it has not stopped the advancement of the gospel. And the gospel has reached the four corners of the Roman Empire through the soldiers, freedmen, slaves, and all those that came into contact with the Apostle Paul. So we see that they accepted the gospel with gladness uh, when Paul preached about the gospel. And we know the gospel is the good news for us today, for all of us who were sinners and repented of our sins and turned, turned towards the Lord Jesus Christ. We also saw that the other believers saw that during Paul's imprisonment, that Paul had joy in the middle of this trial. They also saw that God would take care of Paul even in such circumstances and that God could still use Paul even while he was in prison. We see that the writings in the book of Philippians were marked by being joyful and finding his joy in Christ alone. We also saw lastly that Paul wasn't too concerned by being in chains or being in prison as long as the gospel were preached. So we see that Paul's life was marked by being joyful, by rejoicing, by being thankful, and by having hope. And today we'll get to verses 19 to 24, but before I go on, and I'm not sure, Daisy, the multicultural people? All right, we just want to welcome the multicultural people. Welcome to our service today. We hope you enjoy the service with us. So we'll see uh, at verse 14, but let's quickly just go back to verse 15 to verse 18 of Philippians 1 before we get into today's uh, message. And I'll read for us. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaims Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, wherever in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, that we have your word today, Lord, and that we are able to study your word today. Holy Spirit, we ask you today that you would be the one that will make the word of God alive in our lives, in our heart, and in our minds, that we would be transformed through the Holy Scriptures. We ask that you will open our ears and that you will open our hearts to receive this message, which is the message from you, God. And we thank this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we see Paul is saying that there are actually other people who are preaching the gospel with a pretense. And others are preaching the gospel out of love. So what does this mean? What is Paul saying? Because Paul goes on to say, it doesn't matter if they do it in pretense or in truth as long as the gospel is proclaimed. This sounds a little bit contradicting 
Because Paul is saying, even though they preach the gospel in pretense or in love, we don't matter as long as the gospel is being preached. And this today can cause some confusion in the world today because many uh, can take this interpretation to say that we listen to any message as long as Christ is proclaimed. And that's not always true. We know there are other religions around the world that say um, there are many ways to God. But we know when we write, read the Bible, there's only one way to God. And that's only through Jesus Christ. We have some churches and some pastors that say there are other ways to God, which is, which is wrong. There's only one way to God. So this can quickly... We can quickly make the wrong interpretation of what Paul is saying here. So what is Paul actually saying to us? What does it mean when he says some are preaching in pretense or truth as long as the gospel is proclaimed? And this is 1 Philippians, oh, sorry, Philippians 1, verse 15 to 18. When we look at this, we will see these people who were preaching in pretense, they preached the Bible correctly. There, wasn't, there was nothing wrong with their message, but they had a problem with the Apostle Paul. <laughs> they didn't like the Apostle Paul. They were mocking Paul because of his poor speaking disabilities. Paul wasn't a good speaker, and he himself admitted this. And we find evidence of this in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 6. And you, go, you can go with me. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 6. And this is the Apostle Paul that wrote this. And he says, Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way we have made this plain to you in all things. So we see that Paul struggled to, with some, he had some sort of a speaking dis uh, disability. And the thing is, these other preachers and pastors were making fun of him. So they were preaching, but they were not preaching in love because they were mocking Paul. And in their sermons, they would uh, look down on Paul and elevate themselves so that more people could follow them. So this is actually what Paul is saying. And this is the attitude of Paul. Even though these people were mocking the Apostle Paul, because of his poor speaking disabilities and his constant sufferings that he had to endure, it didn't bother Paul as long as Jesus Christ was still being preached. So we see that Paul lived for Christ. Paul didn't worry about himself. He didn't even worry if the people were mocking him or persecuting him. He did, it didn't matter to him. His only aim in life goal in life was to satisfy the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul still had joy, even though these false teachers or other teachers that um, preach in pretense had many things to say against him. And that is just a short summary of the last part of Philippians 1 uh, from 12 to 18. And today we'll go on from verse 19 and I hope we get to 24 but the main focus will be from verse 19 to verse 21 and that's Philippians 1 19 to 21 and the theme for today is to live is Christ and I'll read for us from verse 19 for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that, but that with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I think we'll stop there at verse 21 first. Uh, and we'll go along uh, through this passage. And in verse 19, it's very interesting. Paul is saying that through the prayers and the Spirit of Jesus, this will turn out for his deliverance. 
And we see the prayers, the word prayers there in verse 19. This referred to the Philippian church. We see the Philippian church was with him from the beginning. They prayed for him. They even cared for him financially and personally. And the word Spirit of Jesus, that's the Holy Spirit. Spirit of Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit. Paul knew that in his weakness, while he was suffering, while he was going through all these things, there was only one help that could actually help him. And that is the Holy Spirit. Even in our, our own lives, even if we try very hard, we can get to a certain point by trying very hard. But at the end of the day, it's the Holy Spirit that carries us when we are at our weakest, when we can't go any further. He is the one who intercedes for us by God the Father. And interesting, the word deliverance in the last, the last word in uh, verse 19 in the original Greek, it refers to salvation. So Paul is actually what Paul is doing here. Paul is quoting scripture from the Old Testament text. And he is speaking of Job uh, 13 verse 16. And Job said this, this will be my salvation that the godless shall not come before him. So Paul is, actually, Paul is actually saying that this will work out for his deliverance. While he's in chains, while he's in imprisonment, this will work out for his deliverance or salvation. So it's interesting, this passage has two interpretations, and I'm going to give it to you, to the two different interpretations of this passage. And the first one is, Paul is saying that through the prayers of the Philippian church and the working of the power of the Holy Spirit in his life, his imprisonment will work out for the good as he would be released later. This letter of the book of Philippians was written in AD 61, more or less. And Paul was released a short while after this letter and Paul was executed in AD 64, AD 67. So we see that Paul was eventually released from prison here, but he was rearrested and eventually he was executed for the cause of Christ. But it's also, also interesting that Paul knew in the sufferings, in the trials, that it was temporary. He knew that this will not be forever. And it's the same with us today. Even our circumstances may be difficult and it may be changing from time to time, but it's never, it is never um, the opposite of temporary. I can't get, <laughs> get on the word now. Thank you very much. Permanent. Uh, our circumstances on earth will never be permanent. It will always be temporary. It's almost like the seasons. We have winter, summer. We've got all those seasons and it's exactly the same in our lives. And the second interpretation regarding this passage is Paul is saying that through the prayers of the Philippian church and the working of the power of the Holy Spirit in him, and like we just discussed, especially when he, are, when he is weak, this will help him to get through these trials, sufferings, tribulations, so that at the end of his earthly life, he will obtain his salvation by being in the presence of Jesus Christ. So we see this passage has two interpretations for us. One is Paul is seeing, looking forward to being released from prison, but he's also looking forward to being with the Lord Jesus Christ. And one thing that I've noticed from the life of Paul, when we read the life of Paul, and especially the, the apostles, first century apostles, it's almost like, God is creating weakness in our lives for a reason. Because if God doesn't create weakness in my life, I would rely on myself the whole time. I would say the whole time, no, but I can do this. I don't, know, I don't need God. I can do it on my own. And it's almost like when we look at Paul, he had a lot of weakness in his life. So it's almost like God created weakness in his life so that Paul could trust more and rely more on God. 
So we can see this throughout Paul's life and the apostles of the first century. Paul knew with certainty that all things will work out for his good. Like we said last week, regardless if it's good or bad in our eyes. Because we are quick to say, but this is bad and this is good. But in God's eyes, it looks a whole lot different than us because God is not like us. and We, we are not like, like God. And in verse 20, Paul is saying, As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. So this actually explains itself. Paul is saying that regardless of what happens to him, anything that comes along his way, he will not be ashamed. And in the first century world, when you were in prison, you were usually looked down on, especially when you were a Christian. So here we have Paul. He actually committed no crime, but he was in prison for the cause of Christ. But Paul is saying that he will not be ashamed by being in chains or while being in prison, but that with his body, through his suffering, through his trials, or even death, God will be honored. The Lord Jesus will be honored through the life of Paul. And Paul was happy as long as the gospel was still proclaimed. And that is, that is most of the time that is the most difficult thing to do in our lives is to preach the gospel when we're going through a tough time because we're focused on our own circumstances and our own feelings and our own problems. But we see Paul is a perfect example of us to preach the gospel in and out season. And verse 21 and verse 21 will be the focus point of today's service. Like the, the theme is to live is Christ. So we can go to verse 21 and I'll read. And Paul says the following. For to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. And that's an awesome statement to make. That is a life sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul lived 101% to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we look at this passage in the original Greek writings, there is no verb in this passage. So it basically means the following. To live, to live Christ to die again. This is actually what it means. To live Christ, to die again. But before we can see uh, what type of life Paul lived for the Lord Jesus Christ, we first need to go and look how did Paul's life look before he met Jesus. Because he lived a totally different life here. And we find this in Philippians 3, Verse 5. Philippians 3, verse 5. Circumcised on the eighth, eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, Blameless. So here we see that Paul, Paul was circumcised on the eighth day in accordance to the Old Testament covenant law. We find this in Leviticus 12 verse 13. So this meant that Paul was a descendant from Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. That he was in a covenant with God. We also see that Paul was from the tribe of Benjamin. And we find evidence of that in 1 Samuel 9, verses 1 to 2. But on top of that, Paul was a Pharisee. So when we look at the Pharisees in the first century world, the Pharisees, they were usually an elite sect of people. 
There were only a handful of them. And they were very noted for their rigorous devotion to the law of God. So they followed the law of God strictly every day of their lives. But they, are, they were actually they were the spiritual athletes in, in the first century world of Judaism. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Their very name meant the separated ones. So they were set apart from all the other people and they followed the law like this. And we also see that Paul was one of the leading persons that persecuted the church. And we see that Paul had this zeal in him. The previous, yeah, verse 6, uh, Philippians 3, verse 6, he had this zeal in him to persecute the church. So we see that Paul, Paul actually lived for himself. Paul lived to uphold the name of the Pharisees. Paul lived to persecute the Christians. We see that Paul lived only for himself. Paul didn't live for God as he maybe thought he had by following the law, but he was persecuting Christians. So it doesn't really make sense. So we see that Paul lived for all of these achievements. And then in Acts 9, we see that the life of Paul was changed, changed upside down. And I'll read to you. You can go with me if you want to. Acts, version, Acts 9. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. So if he found any belonging to the way, and it's interesting, the Christians, before they were called Christians, they referred to them as the way. The disciples, they called them the way. Men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to, a, to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Soul, soul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was outside and neither ate nor drank. So we see Paul, he was persecuting the church. He was persecuting the Christians. And then he met the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus. And Paul's life was instantly changed. He was not the same person as he used to be. And this is the way Paul lived. Galatians 2 verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we see in Acts 8, Paul was a different man. And in Acts 9, we see that he turned around 180 degrees towards the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that Paul wasn't the same. Paul's life was changed when he met the Lord Jesus Christ. And my question to you today is, did your life change the day when you met the Lord Jesus Christ? We see that Paul's life was not the same. He didn't, he didn't live the same way he used to live. And today we can ask ourselves, are we living differently today than we lived before we came to the Lord Jesus Christ? Paul realized that his new life was to live for Jesus alone 
and that all these achievements that he had didn't mean anything and that his only hope and purpose in life was founded in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. We see that Paul preached for the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was persecuted for the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was imprisoned for Jesus. And ultimately, Paul was executed for the Lord Jesus Christ. This, uh, Paul's life is a marvelous example of how to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can maybe say, oh, but this was first century world. It was e more easier for Paul to live this way. The circumstances were different. I still believe what, even though in the first century Paul lived like this, we can still live for Christ like this in all our ways that we live. We see that in the context of this verse and through this whole book of all the letters of Paul, Paul understood that death was not the end for the believer, even for the unbeliever. And the world we live in today, many people think, oh, but this life is all we have. I'm going to maybe have 60, 70 years, and then this is all there was. No, there is a life after this life for the believer and the unbeliever. And we see that Paul knew that the end, even though the end was to come, he would be with the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's ultimate uh, aim in his life was to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. And even if it meant him uh, being executed, that would have been a gain to him. We also see that Paul believed that he would be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ immediately when he died. And even today we have some teachings that say, but no, we'll go into a slumber. It depends now on how you view the end times. When we die, you're going to be in a slumber or you're going to sleep. But when I look at scripture, it's evident to me that when we die, we will be with the Lord Jesus Christ immediately. And follow with me in the next verses. I think it's going to be on the screen. And the first one will be 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. And this was also the Apostle Paul writing here in 2 Corinthians. We see in a few verses uh, further on, uh, Philippians 1, verse 23, Paul said the following. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. So we see that even though Paul uh, was still serving the Philippian community and the church, he wanted to be with them, but he also wanted to be with the Lord. He knew that when he would die, he would be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think the best uh, piece of evidence telling us that we would be with the Lord Jesus immediately when we die, we find in Luke 23, verse 43. And this was when Jesus was on the cross, and he said this to the, the thief next to him. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Yes. So we see that Paul's joy in life was in Christ, and he knew that if he had to die in Christ, he will be with Christ. And that's, this was the life that Paul lived for. And Charles Spurgeon said the following, Though some men may fear dying, no Christian should fear death. When men fear death, it is not certain that they are wicked. But it is quite certain that if they have faith, it is in a very weak and sickly condition. So Charles Spurgeon is saying we as believers, as Christians, we should not be afraid to die. If death should come to us, we should not be afraid because we will be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And my question to you today is, are you confident today that if you should close your eyes tonight, 
you would be with the Lord Jesus Christ? So we see that this was Paul's ultimate aim in life, was to live for Christ and to die for Christ. Paul had no other obligation or thing to live out in his life. And this is a, there is an application for us in this. And the, there are four points. And the first one, before I get to the first one, I want to ask you this question. How does your life look like? What is the most important thing in your life? What is it that you are really living for today? Is it success? Is it wealth? Is it comfort? Family? Work? Or studies? If this is the things that we live for, we will not be able to say to die is gain like Paul. If this is the things where we focus on most of the time, and don't get me wrong, we need to work, we need to study, we need to look after our families, we need to look after ourselves. But if this is our ultimate goal in life, we, would, we won't be able to say to live is Christ and to die is gain. Almost like the young man that came to Jesus in the Gospels and when he asked Jesus that what should he do to follow Jesus and Jesus told him to go and sell all your things. He couldn't do it because that was his motto in life. That is what he lived for. And if, we, if this is the things on top of our list, we would be unable to say, uh, die is gain, like the Apostle Paul. So the first point is for us today, to live for the Lord Jesus Christ, we must trust and submit to his plan. That will be the first one for us today. This is four points for us uh, how to live for Christ. How do we as Christians live for Christ? So the first one would be to trust and submit to God's plan. So do we really trust that the circumstances we have in our life is part of God's plan, uh, regardless if it's good or bad, or even though if we don't fully understand it. Can we say that we still trust you, God? Uh, I don't know where I'm going, Lord, but I still, I still trust you. Can we say this today? And as we see in Luke 22, verse 44, before Jesus was crucified, he said the following, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So we even see, we even see Jesus uh, when he started to sweat blood in the garden. He also told God, but not my will be done, but let your will be done. Can we say this today in our circumstances? Even if we don't know what tomorrow will hold or what next week will hold. Can we trust God's plan? Number two would be to live for Christ we must depend on the body of Christ. And the body of, the body of Christ, it is us sitting here today. It is not the physical building. It is us, the members, the hands and the feet of Christ. We see that throughout Paul's ministry, he relied on the support of the Philippian church. We as the body of Christ should rely on each other and help each other where we can through support and prayers. That is what our job is to do. We need to care for one another. We need to pray for one another. We need to reach out to one another. And we see this in Mark 14, verse 34. And Jesus said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And this is Jesus himself being fully God, being fully man. Before his crucifixion, he asked three of his disciples to please come and pray with him. 
So we see how important prayer is and the disciples couldn't pray with the Lord Jesus. They weren't watchful. So we need to rely on each other. Number three will be to live for Christ. We must exalt Christ in everything that we do. And are we exalting Christ in our jobs, our studies, our relationships, or our dealings with strangers, people's that, people that we don't know, or our enemies? Are we exalting Christ through this? Are we doing everything as unto the Lord without arguing or grumbling? And it's so easy, and I speak speak of myself first and foremost to argue or to grumble but I don't want to do this or I'm not in the mood to do this how do we exalt Christ in these areas of our lives how does our jobs look like are we still thankful for the jobs we have even though it doesn't always go our way or we're not maybe getting that promotion we ought to get um, am I uh, exalting God in my studies? Am I putting everything in to exalt Him? How does my relationships look like? My, my marriage, my friends, my, my parents. Uh, am I investing in those things? Am I exalting Christ through these things? And especially strangers, people I meet that I don't know. I can also exalt Christ through that. In Colossians 3, Verse 23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. So in everything that we do, we ought to do it unto the Lord, not unto people. But let's go another step further in this. Is Jesus Christ exalted through my trials, tribulations, sickness and sufferings? Can I exalt Christ through these things that bring me down, that may, makes me to lose focus? Can I exalt Christ in this? And the fourth one, to live for Christ, we must have eternity in our minds. Even though we are living on earth, we are already citizens of heaven, the believers, Philippians 3 verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do we still think of eternity? Is there some days where you know that when you die today, you will be with Christ? So we can actually say we are aliens. If I look at this passage, because our citizenship is in heaven already, and we are here. When we face death, and our last moment on earth, all that will really matter at that point will be what we did for the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing else at that time will play a role or matter. May our lives resemble the following motto, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Amen. This is all that's going to matter at the end of time. We can have many achievements and we can do many things through our lives, but at the end, when we stand face to face with death, all that will matter is that I accept the gospel, that I accept the good news of Jesus Christ, uh, that I live for the Lord Jesus Christ, and that I proclaim His gospel. These are the things that will matter one day when we stand before death. And I want to encourage you, if you are uncertain about these things, I do not want you to leave the service today without coming speak to myself or speak with Miranda. If you are unsure about your eternity and these things, please do not hesitate to come and speak with us. Heavenly Father, we, we say thank you, God. Thank you that 
we have the privilege of, of being called children of God, but not through our own works or through what we have done, but through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you today, God. Thank you that you sent your Son to save us from ourselves and to save us from the wrath that has to come upon our lives, God, because we were disobedient, Lord, towards you, God. And we ask you today, Holy Spirit, that you will help us to, to live for Christ every day of our lives, where we go, um, in everything that we do, that that will be our ultimate aim in life, that we will do everything as we would do unto the Lord Jesus Christ, and that we will do nothing from our own selfish ambition or our own desires or passions, but that the Lord Jesus Christ will be the one we live for. I pray today, Holy Spirit, that you will help us, that we will be able to say in confidence to live is Christ and to die is gain. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Have a wonderful Sunday. Enjoy your vacation tomorrow if you do have vacation and we'll see all of you next week. Thank you.